You're listening to the Braver Angels Podcast, a new way of talking politics. And I'm our host for today, John Wood Jr. Um, to jump right into things, I am joined by a young man who I respect immensely, and I know I speak for many other people in saying so. Um, he is a columnist at uh, Quillette Magazine, uh, recently taken a new position uh, with the Manhattan Institute, and also my, uh, my colleague at the uh, 1776 um, Project. Uh, Coleman Hughes, welcome to the Braver Angels podcast. It's great to be here, John. Yeah, it's good to be here with you too. And we were just remarking when we uh, started off that both of us have sort of we're sort of growing out the naturals and the facial hair uh, <laughs> a little bit. And so, you know, one of the subtler consequences of life on lockdown is that I think uh, hair fashion is uh, going uh, going a bit retro. You know, uh, which uh, you know, from my vantage point, isn't such a bad thing. Um, but we're in a moment where long hair isn't the only thing that's making a comeback. Uh, racial unrest, strife across the country, has um, taken, I think, in combination with you know massive economic contractions and and uh, political polarization and obviously fear over uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. It's made this feel like one of the most I think precarious moments <clears throat> to have perhaps ever for, for us to have been alive really in uh, American history. I mean, it feels like one of those just critical crossroads. Yes. So, yeah. So I, I want to, I want to talk with you uh, here today um, about race, which is a subject that's fairly familiar to us both. Um, I think mm-hmm. that we can have um, really a, perhaps a, not just a good conversation, but an important conversation here today, because I think that, you and I are overwhelmingly simpatico uh, in terms of where we ultimately want to get to with the, um, with the racial conversation in America and with the African-American community. And yet I think that we probably employ some different analytical tools um, just because our, I think our, our backgrounds are a little bit different uh, intellectually in how we come to things that might allow us to sharpen each other's understanding of things. Um, maybe it'll mostly be you sharpening my understanding, but either way, um, I think we can maybe provide some, some deep insight into some areas where it is needed. So my first question to you, Coleman, before we go further, is um, there are massive assumptions made about the baseline reality of relationships between law enforcement and the African-American community. One of the things we see claimed all over the place is that, you know, uh, state violence against the black community is epidemic in this country and people are responding to that sentiment. I'd like to ask you, um, as a person well versed in, you know, the relevant facts and figures here, um, what are the what are the significant statistical points that the American people are not aware of that perhaps would be, you know, beneficial to us in informing our understanding of the reality of you know black relationship to law enforcement and maybe just to the system, so to speak, generally speaking. So a lot of the perception is shaped by social media. People don't uh, actually look at the whole picture; they just see what they see in their news feeds. Mm-hmm. And what they see in their news feeds is is it's almost hard to exaggerate how tiny a slice of reality it is, and how how deeply non-random that sample of reality is. So for example, the protests, virtually all of what we see are, um, you know, the rioters being violent and the cops beating on protests, uh, pro- protesters. But really that constitutes probably 0.1% of what's going on right now. The overwhelming majority, um, and I can say this from having been to several protests, is protesters, peacefully protesting and cops peacefully standing by. So it's very easy to get the impression if you're just looking on social media that you know everything is going haywire on both sides and depending on whether your news feed tilts right wing or left wing, you're gonna see more of the rioters or more of the cops beating on people. Right. So if you wanna have an actual picture of what's going on, you have to look 
at the whole picture. And when we talk about police violence, there are about 50 million police civilian interactions in America every year. 1,000 of that 50 million end in uh, a suspect getting shot and killed. Uh, over 90% of that subset of 1,000, the suspect is armed and dangerous at the time that they are killed. So last year, you know, there were 56 unarmed Americans shot dead by cops. So that's 56 out of 50 million mm -hmm. police civilian interactions. Just off the bat, it's worth saying, regardless of your race, your odds of getting shot unarmed by the cops are on, on, par, on par with your odds of getting struck by lightning. Right. So there is no epidemic. Um, and, you know, that is, I think, a point that gets lost. Mm -hmm. I think if you were to ask the typical protester how many unarmed Black people get killed every year by cops, I don't know what answer they would give, but, but it wouldn't be 15, which I think is the number from last year. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you want to remark at all upon the um, comprehensiveness or, or, or lack thereof of the available data with respect to this? So in other words, I, I take your point on the statistics. Some people will say that there really is not great information about the sort of broad um, about the, the, the broad interactions between, you know, the black community and, and law enforcement, that the samplings that we have are taken from individual departments, but there hasn't been necessarily a comprehensive survey of departments across America. Are, are you impressed at all by the limitations in the available data, or is it enough, do you think, for us to say with confidence that, like you said, the real odds of being killed by a police officer as an unarmed person, white or black, is just vanishingly small? Um, I would say both. Uh, our 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 database is not perfect. Mm -hmm. Right now, we don't have like we don't have the federal government saying to every state, "You need to give us careful data um, on pain of losing funding, um, no matter what, every year, and it has to be accurate." We don't have that. Mm -hmm. uh, before 2015, we didn't even have careful journalist journalistic databases of all the police shootings that go on every year, which is pretty astounding. So we're, we've been behind the curve on this issue and we're still behind the curve on it. Mm. However, uh, the journalistic database kept by the Washington Post and another one by the Guardian, they're pretty damn good. Once we, once we do have a federal database in place, it will be better, but I would strongly bet that the numbers will not be very much higher. What we have, what we know now is your odds of being killed this way are are on par with a lightning strike. And that fact is, is very unlikely to be shown to be false when we have better data. Understood. And so one of the implications of that statistical observation, and I do just want to make just just comment on the fact that it is amazing, you know, outside of, you know, Fox News and talk radio and, you know, certain both right-leaning and also center-left-leaning, you know, outlets um, online uh, and from voices like yourself, of course. It is amazing how infrequently you hear those numbers mentioned. I, I, I just watched uh, uh, most of an episode of Fried Zakaria GPS on CNN, and Fried Zakaria is somebody who I personally have a great deal of respect for as a thinker and an intellect and somebody who I I feel like you can usually rely on to paint the whole picture, empirically speaking, behind a certain issue. Uh, but, you know, he led a segment by uh, sort of, you know, by, by putting up pictures of, of George Floyd and uh, Michael Brown and uh, Breonna Howard and Tamir Rice. and, and Bre Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor, I'm sorry. Yeah. Breonna, um, killed in Kentucky. And, um, you know, making the point that, um, you know, basically – saying that, you know, another police killing of an unarmed black man, and he made the comment, when will, when will it end, right? Which is a mm -hmm. fair question to be sure, mm -hmm. but I think it's also fair to, to include um, the piece that you've just laid out here, because it's hard to see how that could not be critically relevant mm -hmm. to our understanding of the truth of where we are at in terms of, you know, police relationships with the African American community. Uh, you know, a whole episode of this very important show on CNN, I, I don't recall that ever having been introduced to the discussion. So that 
seems to lend credence to the idea that there's a narrative uh, that is, you know, coming through in the racial conversation, particularly in the mainstream and progressive left, that is not comfortable perhaps allowing for the introduction of, of certain facts. So let me, let, me, let me put that on the table. Having said that, though, I do, uh, I, I do think that, well, so one of the main, one, one major implication of what you've stated of that figure is that there is, in fact, in contrast to, you know, in contradiction of the claims being made, uh, apparently no compelling statistical reason to think that law enforcement in America is racist in general towards the African American uh, community. So would you, would you say that as a statistical matter, um, there's no reason for us to draw that conclusion on the basis of the number of police killings of African Americans in a given year? Yeah, so if we're talking about deadly shootings, um, yes, I would say that. I've looked at four careful studies, one of, one of which was by the economist Roland Fryer, who was himself black and grew up having um, rough interactions with the police that ad he, he admitted going into the study that he expected to find anti-black bias mm -hmm. in deadly shootings, but did not find it. Right. Um, and he looked at, I think, 10 major American cities and there are three other studies that found the same result. Uh, what, what people have to keep in mind here is that that doesn't mean there is no racism in the cops. Um, there, there, you know, many of these studies have found that cops are, quick, are quicker to put their hands on a black or Hispanic suspect, uh, quicker to rough him up. But if you're talking about pulling the trigger, mm -hmm. there is no compelling evidence that the cops are quicker to do that for a black suspect than for a white suspect. Mm. And the, the, the impression that they are comes from two things. One, it comes from a massive amount of coverage bias in the media. There are videos of white people getting killed by the cops in just the same way, just as horrifically. Uh, there's a guy named Tony Timpa who was killed the same way George Floyd was on camera, pinned mm -hmm. to the ground with a knee in his upper back for 13 minutes, whimpering, begging to be let go um, and dying uh, at the hands of this cop. All the while, the cops joking about joking about him and uh, telling him to get up for school, um, not knowing they've killed him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Dylan Noble, Daniel Shaver, just look up these videos. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there are dozens of white people that get killed this way every year. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, I mean, the, but those ones, they never get elevated to national media. So we get the false impression that this is, the type of thing that only or overwhelmingly happens to black people. It's just not true. Right. And I take your point, of course, that media and social media reinforce, um, reinforce this. You're making two points. One, that media and social media reinforces this perception of state violence towards African-Americans being epidemic. Um, but that also, uh, it is not necessarily the case that there's not reason to think that there is perhaps some, some genuinely greater hostility that levels itself towards black and brown people uh, within law enforcement or from law enforcement than is the case with other groups. It just doesn't, at least on the basis of statistics, uh, it doesn't seem to manifest itself in a significant, in the, in the type of disproportionate rate of police killings of black unarmed black people that you would think would be the case from listening to the tone and tenor of the media. But that takes us into a lane that I think is actually perhaps most important for us to build out our understanding uh, a little bit. If part of what we want to grasp uh, as Americans is sort of, you know, what, where is this beyond the, you know, beyond the media narrative seeming to, you know, perpetuate in a certain direction, what accounts for this uh, upwelling of anger? Uh, from the black community and, and others, of course, um, in response to, you know, in response to these situations. Um, I um, was having a conversation with uh, Kim Iverson. I don't know if you know Kim Iverson. She's a friend of mine, popular uh, left-leaning uh, YouTuber. And um, Kim is a little bit older than I am. She's, I think, 40 years old or so. Uh, she's half Vietnamese, half white, but she grew up in rural Idaho. And she made the point that when she was when she was growing up in the eighties and you know maybe early nineties, there was a um, at a certain point there was a rash of police killings uh, of people in in uh, in or near her community, 
this was a white community. Uh, the cops were killing white people uh, at an alarming rate, and it became, you know, became a scandal uh, in this in this part of the ta- uh, part of the state. And uh, relationships between the police and the community deteriorate, deteriorated. Her feeling, though, was that this was sort of a class issue, sort of an economic uh, issue. That maybe the question here is not so much co- uh, color, but but uh, economic status and. We pursued that that line of thinking, but I, I have my own sort of thinking about this, which is a little bit a little bit different. Um, although it can tie in race and and, and, and class, I imagine that um, as a law enforcement officer, well, law enforcement police departments exist as institutions, right? And I do believe that there's a way in which the personalities of institutions evolve in interaction with the communities that they service, and that. Same thing could be said for a school or for a church. Uh, but in the case of law enforcement, you are entrusted with the tool of force. And, you know, that tool is one that you have to apply to certain members of the community that you're serving as part of the job description. And in that context, particularly if internal to police departments, there is not, I think, a counterbalancing sort of, uh, sort of, sort of uh, culture at, at play. It is hard to imagine how that does not necessitate to some degree sort of the development of an adversarial culture between members of law enforcement and whoever they're policing, right? Um, Just because the nature of that relationship is conflict and forceful conflict. And so if you take color out of the equation, I imagine that you're still going to have cases where there's genuine, you know, the potential at least for genuine contempt <clears throat> excuse me, to exist between law enforcement officers and the segment of, you know, the community that they most frequently have to police. If you introduce color to that equation, it seems very likely to me that the cult, the adversarial culture that gets introduced probably becomes color-coded. And therefore, within law enforcement departments, if there is naturally sort of an adversarial sort of uh, feeling that winds up developing towards a, at least a segment of the community they're, they're policing, um, that's going to express itself potentially in language and mannerisms that, that are triggered to some degree in a way that's correlated to the color of the people they're policing and that people who they're policing, the surrounding community picks up on that and returns with a sort of defensiveness and, and, and fear in their own behavior in kind. And so to make it a little more concrete, um, you um, and I have both been influenced, I think, by the book Ghetto Side by uh, Julie Ovi of the LA Times. That book is, uh, it is an overview of the, the history of, of uh, uh, policing uh, in South Los Angeles in particular, um, historically and up into, I think, the early 2000s or so. That book is set in the community where I live. I'm talking to you from South LA. And so, you know, uh, in reading that book, I'm reading about the streets that I've walked on and been down before. What she, part of what she talks about in that book is, and, you know, part of what she does go into a, a, a bit is the, the fact that police killings of unarmed Black people in Los Angeles in particular have been diminishing for some time. Nevertheless, you do have this phenomenon of, what you could easily argue, what I would argue would be uh, over-policing of minor offenses, things like recreational marijuana, possession, loitering, so on and so forth, um, that set the stage for a general climate of hostility between the two sides. But because you do have crime in South Los Angeles at higher rates than you have it in, in other communities, because you do have genuine friction here, there are conversations that take place within the, the police department, at least in recent years past in Los Angeles, where officers, and she gives sort of anecdotal portrayals of this, will ask themselves and say, you know, you know what is wrong with black people in, in particular, right? And, uh, you know, these are people, again, whose relationships with the black community are defined in this, in this space. Now, I know officers in the LAPD, and I've had the luxury of being able to sit down with one or two of them and go through various parts of this book and say, does this ring true to you? Did she get mm-hmm. this right? And, you know, from what I can tell in my conversations, Julie Ovi is correct in describing, at least in years past, an environment within some of our precincts where 
the attitude of law enforcement towards towards black people per se, at least in the context of the black people they are policing, becomes very negative um, and and cynical. But this is this when you when you factor that when you factor that reality into a context to, to where black people can suddenly predictably i think experience some level of of judgment and aggressiveness from law enforcement officers at the same time that law enforcement officers can expect uh, a level of fear and hostility and rejection from the community they're serving then this creates an environment in which everybody is in a sense sort of you know, perpetuating, I think, the distrust, and yet everyone is also a victim of it, right? So we tend to want to ask ourselves in a chicken and egg fashion, well, who's to, who's to blame? Folks on the left will more typically say law enforcement, the state, a lot of folks on the right will say this is a cultural issue within the black community. But I see these relationships being, these dynamics being perpetuated in real time in a concurrent fashion mm-hmm. on both sides, just because it's the situation we found ourselves in for historic reasons. And so I, when I look at George Floyd, when I look at the riots that have ensued, I, I don't see it as, even if it, ex, if it articulates itself this way, I see this as a larger reaction on the part of the black community, not so much to the narrow statistics of police killings of unarmed black men. I feel like that is more symbolic. But what it symbolizes to me is an anger and a larger state of affairs in which they intuitively know, many folks in the black community feel like they intuitively know that law enforcement you know, dislikes them, that they have a condemnatory sort of attitude towards them, that there's a larger system in which other forces are, feel disparaging in their relationship towards the black community. And I actually think that they're right um, in many, many respects, um, but that the situation is simply complicated for some of the reasons I've alluded to. So let, let me pause there and, and get your reaction. John, I think that's really spot on. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, the way I would put it is I can imagine myself thinking from the cop's point of view and thinking from, say, uh, you know, a 22 year old black man's point of view, yeah. born and raised in the hood, who himself, you know, may or may not, let, let's say for the sake of argument, is not involved in any violent crime activity, you know, smokes a little weed here and there, Mm -hmm. but, you know, grew up in the kind of environment where you have to have that, you know, that masculine macho, you know, sensibility Mm -hmm. and who understands who, who that every time the cops pull him over can simply feel that they are more suspicious of him than they would be, uh, even a similarly dressed white guy just from the way he talks, the, his mannerisms, he feels it and he's not wrong. And he's not wrong to be angry mm. that he is liable to more suspicion. Right. At the same time, if I look at it from the cop's point of view, it is objectively true that people like him, people who look like him, are massively overrepresented in violent crime. So if you, if you are trying to do your job you know, a halfway smartly, let's say, as a cop, you would be a fool to focus just as much on the average white guy as you, as you, as you would the average black guy, because at 14% of the population, black people are um, committing and suffering 52% of the homicides. That's a massive disparity. Mm. Um, So, I can see it from both sides and I can see how, you know, everyone involved is, is acting and reacting to circumstances in a more or less rational way. Mm -hmm. But every, you know, the cops come away with a feeling of, you know, what the hell is going on with the black community? Why is there so much violence here relative to other communities? Um, And then black people come away feeling, you know, the majority of black people, the vast majority are not criminals even in the most criminal neighborhoods, hmm. they come away thinking, what the hell is wrong with the cops? They are always, I can just feel it when they look at me, that right. they look at me different. Right. And that's an infuriating feeling. 
And I, I think you're probably right that to some degree that the issue of black people being shot by de shot dead by cops, you know, it, it might not even matter if they knew how small the numbers are, if they knew it was on par with a lightning strike, because it does symbolize a, a wider reality of disparate treatment and suspicion. And what's even more troubling is I'm not sure how we could have a sane police system that didn't treat the typical black person with disparate suspicion g mm. given the underlying reality of racial disparity in crime that's well, a first crime is a first order problem and you know so I, I don't know how we get out of this on either side well i have some i have some thoughts about that um let me let me take the issue on the table and just concretize it just a little further with an anecdote uh, of my own. Um, and um, this will give us the, the opportunity to talk a bit about our own personal experiences here, because I think that they're relevant to understanding sort of the spectrum of African-American attitudes towards America, which is a general subject we, you and I are concerned with, certainly. Um, but, you know, I grew up uh, in a very multicultural sort of, you know, middle-class um, environment. Grew up in Culver City, which is a uh, highly integrated uh, and, you know, relatively well-to-do uh, suburban city in Los Angeles. But I married a woman from, from Watts who uh, grew up, uh, her, her, her earliest memories of American life were in the riots. You can say that her formative experience with American life was literally in a, in a domestic war zone, right? And living in Watts and growing up in Watts, she's seen more death over the course of her life through, through murder, through gang violence. And she's seen police brutality. She's seen more carnage than some people who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so that sets a, a, a marker between her black experience and mine right away. But I wanna give you a small anecdote uh, from my life, which is informative, not because it is extreme, but because it is, I think, routine. I've been pulled over for you know, speeding and had you know, encounters with police officers in the San Fernando Valley, uh, in, you know, yeah, probably in Culver City and Simi Valley, in areas that are, you know, more middle class, more white. And I'm a person who, you know, speaks himself a certain way. I'm an African, African American, but I was raised, you know, sort of shown how to deal with authority figures, so on and so forth. And so I, I can't ever remember having, um, I've, I've run into cops who are more or less rude, of course, but I can't ever remember having a hostile interaction with a police officer um, in some of these suburban communities where I've encountered police. Living in the Jordan Downs projects in Watts though, which I did for about a year or so with my wife's family, um, my experience was definitely different. I can remember, uh, I would have been, you know, 22 years old or 21 years old, I think. Um, I can remember driving, uh, leaving uh, my, uh, my wife's apartment in the projects to go to school. I was, going to community college um, in the South Bay. And uh, driving down the street, I came to a four-way intersection where I noticed that there's a police car parked on the right side, on the right side, on my right, to, uh, uh, on the intersection. Um, and as I pulled up to the stop sign, I realized that I had left my, uh, I, I had left my folder on the table uh, at, at home with all of my notes and, you know, probably had homework that I needed to turn in. So I realized, ah, geez, I've got I've to double back. And so I hooked the U-turn in front of this officer um, and went back the other way. And as I did so, he signaled his lights and pulled off after me. Now, I had done nothing illegal, you know. And I wondered what he was pulling me over for, although in the back of my mind, I felt like I sort of knew. Um, he comes up to the window after pulling me over. Now, in prior experiences, you know, in other parts of town with, with police officers, usually I'll have officers approach me and, you know, sometimes they might even say, you know, good afternoon or, you know, hello, sir, some, some show of respect. And they'll say, do you know why I stopped you, right? Um, in this case, the officer approached me in just uh, in a real gruff way. Didn't say good afternoon, didn't call me sir. He said, why did you turn around? You know, barked it at me. And, uh, and I responded and I said, well, I said, I was officer. I said, I was on my way to, I was on my way to school. I go to Pierce College and 
torrents, but I looked, uh, I looked over and I realized I had forgot my folder uh, on my desk at home. So I've got to go back and get it because I've got an assignment to turn in. Now, immediately, the way I'm speaking signals something different to him than what he was expecting. And so he says, you know, he says, license and registration, barks it again. I show my license. I open my wallet so he can see my school ID too. And I hand him my license. He goes back, he runs it. I know he's not going to find anything on my record because there's nothing to find. Um, but after taking a very long time, he, he comes back to the car. Uh, my window's rolled down. He doesn't even look at me, look at me in the eye. He, he all but flings my idea back, the, back to me through the window. And through gritted teeth, he says, have a, have a nice day. And um, he, he turns around and he walks off, almost as if he was disappointed, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, whoever that officer is, I'm going to imagine that it's quite possible he didn't come into law enforcement work with that kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he did. Uh, but even if he did, I think he'd be the exception. And yet, I don't think he was that exceptional in terms of the attitude he had at that moment. Um, you know, uh, first of all, I mean, him, him pulling me over in that way, I, the, the, you know, I think you could argue that that was an infringement, uh, infringing on my civil liberties. And yet, to your point, Coleman, I understand why he was suspicious, you know, in the context of if he is looking out for suspicious behavior and looking to, you know, looking to, I think, get something on folks who are doing things illegal, that's the type of behavior that his institutional reality is programmed him, to, him towards. You magnify that out, though, and that becomes an instructive example because, you know, that's the type of thing that very innocent, to your point again, Coleman, uh, black folks in a community like Watson in South L.A. are experiencing in relationship to law enforcement every day. Um, so I want to just take that and use it as an opportunity to talk about something you and I have in common um, because this gets us to the difference in black experiences, right? I've been black in America my whole life. Um, it took me 20 some odd years to have an experience like that with the police officer. And that only happened because I had moved to an inner city community from a suburban community. I was listening to your conversation with Chloe Valdery, who's, you know, a friend of mine and has been on this podcast a couple of times. And I heard you and Chloe talking about the fact that you and her are, it's very hard for you guys to feel a general antipathy towards, you know, white people or Jewish people and so forth and, and others just because, perhaps because you grew up uh, in such close relationship to folks across the cultural spectrum. And I did too. And, you know, I'm, I'm half white myself and I, I came from a very, you know, multicultural sort of landscape, uh, I mentioned, you know, in which I felt very, very accepted. I trusted authority figures. In, in Culver City, in my community, uh, where I grew up. And um, I think, though, that it is important for people to recognize the spectrum of, of Black experiences, because we do get the impression that there is one Black experience. Um, I mentioned my wife's experience, um, very different from mine. And I'm wondering, from your vantage point, what are the implications for our understanding of the reality of black life in America, or how important is it for us to talk a little bit about the variety of black experiences and how this yields differing reactions within the African American communities to the things that we see on the news. Uh, if you could just comment on that in general, if you want to say anything about your own personal upbringing, I think it could be, uh, I think it could be helpful. Yeah, well, obviously there's a huge variety of, of experiences and, you know, John McWhorter I think once said that people often talk about black America as if it's one big inner city, mm. uh, which, you know, could not be further from the truth. If you actually look at what percentage of black people grow up in something close to the stereotype of a crime ridden inner city, it's, it's certainly less than half. Um, there's a substantial black middle class. There's now a substantial upper middle class as well. And I grew up in that upper middle class in a very diverse town. Um, you know, I had, you know, growing up, I had an equal amount of black and white friends, uh, lots of Jewish friends. It's a very, very heavily Jewish area as well. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was also a town with, you know, no significant police brutality issue mm -hmm. with regard to uh, black people, racism, etc. So 
Yeah, I mean, no doubt that can shape your experience. Um, but I don't think my opinion is just a function of my experience. I think a lot of people who can come from the same background as me are, um, you know, agree with, you know, f fully with the, the most radical section of Black Lives Matter. Mm. Um, and a lot of people, you know, like uh, Glenn Lowry from the South Side of Chicago, and I think f from what I can tell has a perspective on it closer to mine. So I'm always wary of people reducing someone's opinion. Well, you just think that because you come from this place. Um, I don't know. You know, I, as I always say, Thomas Sowell and James Baldwin came from the same neighborhood, Harlem, yeah. you know, the most, most important black conservative and one of the most important black liberals grew up blocks apart from each other. Right. Um, but there's another thing I wanted to say about, uh, about your, your story with the police officer is that, uh, I think to a certain degree, the job of policing tends to attract a person who loves laying down the law, mm -hmm. you know, just like, you know, uh, any job attracts a certain personality profile disproportionately. Um, you know, people who would, who would, ne who think of themselves as never being able to be violent with anyone, they never think to become cops. Whereas people who, you know, perhaps tend towards the more masculine and aggressive side by, by nature are more likely to become cops to begin with. So there's that problem, which, you know, is probably impossible to solve. But then there's, there's there's the accumulated experience that comes along with being a cop right. um it is it's worth reminding people a cop gets shot just about every day in america mm -hmm. um cops are much 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 more likely to get shot than any other demographic you could really name mm -hmm. and I, to me it's it's a little bit strange that we are having this national conversation without so much as hearing a cop's perspective. I haven't heard a single cop, you know, on Twitter or on the news really even just kind of educate non-cops as to what it's like to be a cop. Imagine if we were talking about dismantling the med medical system and nobody heard from a single doctor or nurse. Um, because the truth is there's, there's things that you can only really know by talking to someone who has the practical experience of, of having been through the job. And that, that's not to say we, I'm going to agree with every, everything the typical cop thinks about these things. They may have a, a bias towards defending their own profession, mm -hmm. but we have to understand it. If we're talking about it, like we know about it, we have to understand it. Yeah. What is it like to be a, a, a B cop every day working in a neighborhood where, um, you know, someone is getting murdered every day right. um, where you know a certain amount of suspects do have a gun in the glove compartment and they're waiting to pull it out That's right. um, so all of that is important I heard a story from a colleague um, of mine who has <clears throat> relationships with um, officers in the DMV area DC Maryland Virginia area about an officer just in the last several days who was apprehending a suspect who had his arm held to his, who had uh, taken the suspect's arm and had pinned it around to his back and was holding him down. And as he did so, a crowd formed around them because the man was screaming that the officer was breaking his arm very, very pleadingly. And so with the crowd massing, the officer let go of the man's arm. And as he did so, the man reached, uh, the man reached um, into his waistband and pulled out a gun and shot the officer, <laughs> remarkably, right? Um, and so I only mentioned that uh, to your point that, you know, the officer's perspective is relevant. I mean, I don't see how one could justify, and this isn't to skip due process. It's just to say that from the outside, I don't see how the killing of George Floyd and, and you know, just that, that maneuver that with the, with the officer's knee on his neck for that length of time, um, I, I, I can hardly begin to imagine a justification for that, but that doesn't negate the need to have the community of law enforcement, the insight of police officers 
be part of what informs our conversation because there's a general there are general experiences that ultimately fill out the substance of our reality here. But that's also why, uh, Coleman, I make reference to sort of the, the differing experiences of, of Black America, I think, in understanding our context, taking the point, of course, that individuals can come from any, any uh, part of the landscape of Black experience and still arrive in, in what might appear to be on the surface counterintuitive uh, social conclusions. But I always sort of perceive a bit of a difference between individuals and, and groups. I think that individuals are always likely to be more fluid and adaptable in their thinking than groups are. So I think that the thinking of groups is shaped by sort of the exchange of experiences within general circumstances that lock us into a certain perspective, unless, you know, the environment of communication can be shifted in a way that allows us to become better listeners. And so that, that takes me to what I hope can be a constructive point here as we go into our, our final minutes, because I know your, your, time is, your time is short. But what I'm, what I'm hoping, here's what I think is good about the moment that we're in. There's so much bad about the moment that we're in, but here, here's what I think is good about it. I do think, and you can, I'm sure you can say the same thing, but people have been reaching out to me particularly a lot of white people from across America, asking me to give them some insight into what's going on in, in, in Black America, between Black folks and the police, institutional racism, and what can we, what, how should good people respond? I think that it is a good thing that many folks in America are listening as if with new ears um, to the sort of general, to, 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 to the general suffering of the African-American community, because I do believe that that suffering is real. I don't believe that it is, one, I don't believe it is necessarily as well understood uh, as it should be, and that goes to the earlier part of our conversation, even on an empirical level. Two, I, I think that the gains are very limited in terms of merely dwelling on that pain without looking at constructive avenues for solving the problems that impact the black community in America, largely speaking. But the fact that there is this uh, rise of concern uh, for the African American community, I think, I think is a good thing, provided that we do not take the, the understandably volatile emotions of the moment and use it as an opportunity to exercise uh, sort of a social vengeance that allows, you know, these certain groups of us to achieve short-term political and social gains at the expense of the broader health of our democracy while also failing to advance the material um, progress necessary to really impact the broader and deeper problems of the Black community and of America in general. Because I do believe that the fate of America, practically speaking, is very much tied up in the fate of Black America. Uh, I think that this moment will have proved itself to be a good thing if we can engage it in a way that allows us to say, look, there is, an, there is a reality to the Black experience uh, in America that is complex, that is nuanced, but that if we understand it and understand it in conversation with the real experiences of the varying groups, including law enforcement, white America generally, uh, so on and so forth, um, if we understand the Black experience in nuanced and in deeper appreciation of its true substance and the substance of the experience of other groups, we can begin to create the context for a, for a conversation over these issues that points us in the direction of perhaps intelligent systematic reforms alongside sort of a reappreciation re of perhaps some of the cultural shifts that need to take place not just internal to the black community, but internal to policing and, and maybe even just within the context of our larger sort of civic and political conversation, which lends itself to the type of simple sloganeering that is so easily, that so easily feeds in to the, I think, sort of polarization of, a, of, a, of, of our society um, in a fashion that has prevented us from being able to function to address important social and, and, and material issues. That is my hope for the moment. I think that there is potential for it. Of course, I work in a space that focuses on that. Um, I'm wondering if my hopes align with yours. Absolutely. I mean, 
you know, I, I think the last thing I want to come out of this is simply to have a repeat of the pseudo conversation that is Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. Right. Simply screaming these two slogans mm -hmm. uh, across the aisle as if they both can't be true at the same time. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, uh, the, the conversation has been extremely partisan, extremely shallow. Uh, it's been people reacting to their first gut emotion on an issue. People, you know, demonizing the cops at all costs. Other people defending the cops, no matter what kind of abuse they perpetrate. And there's been very little effort I, that I've seen to have a really evidence-based, you know, rational conversation about this deeply important issue. Mm. Um, so yeah, that, that's my hope for this. I don't really think it's gonna happen. Um, I think the, the few people that are interested in it, uh, you know, you and I included are trying our best to have, have conversations that are as in touch with reality, as, as in touch with all of the conflicting facts uh, that matter um, as we can, but you know, I'm not super hopeful. I do think that there's a way in which success in this project has to be judged in two different, two different lanes. On the one hand, there's the question, Coleman, what can you and I and others do folks listening to this podcast, Brave Angels members, readers of yours, and, and well beyond. What can we do uh, to confront the volatility of the moment and try and limit the damage that even very, very well-meaning people on all sides, right and left, um, maybe the limit the damage that we are doing to each other and to ourselves uh, by, I think, being so stimulated by our tribal uh, animus in the context of our you know, differences of opinions here that we, that we don't stop to see, um, see the cost that we're paying in terms of the institutional stability of society um, and the way in which we're willfully accepting just sort of the, the collateral of destroying people's reputations for voicing opinions that are outside of a given Overton window and, you know, the ways in which we are, the ways in which we have become, I think, the ways in which we become complacent in sort of, you know, elevating, I guess, um, perspectives that are just so, so baked in anger, so baked in bitterness that we forget that, you know, ultimately goodwill between groups has to be the foundation for understanding and political freedom, right, and for prosperity. We have to minimize the extent to which that damage becomes indelible in this moment. But the second way in which we have to measure success is by modeling that sort of conversation ourselves, Coleman. And I think by building up through, through media, through the sorts of programmatic structures that Brave Angels and other organizations are developing, and the type of institutional and organizational entrepreneurialism that is seeking to sort of circumvent, you know, in, in some respects, the limitations of the mainstream media and the convening powers of the political parties and so forth. We have to build things that create the foundation for civil society to heal and rebuild itself, I think, as we come out of this moment, you know, because this moment will end and, and we'll need to impact and, and try and, you know, try and keep people, try and provide leadership in terms of maintaining our perspective in the moment. But then there becomes the project of laying the foundation and building upon the foundation that was laid before you and I got here by Dr. King and the nonviolent movement and, and those who have you know, worked for a more perfect union and for the beloved community, which basically just says that you know, a conversation that safeguards liberty, I think, is one that is born of goodwill and an aspiration towards trust between different groups of people. And if we can protect that foundation, I think we'll always be able to grow from it um, once again. And so those are the two those are the two frames in which I sort of consider our, our work at the moment. And I wish you and I had more time to go into detail about that, because uh, I think there's a, there's a deeper and, and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and a useful conversation 
to drag you into <laughs> on that front. Not that you would be kicking and screaming by any means. But having said all that, Coleman, I'd like to give you uh, give you the last uh, last word here um, in our final uh, final uh, few minutes. Um, you know, um, do you have um, um, what are your feelings about the project of of the beloved community? Um, do you feel, in spite of the pessimism of the moment, that there is meaningful work for us to do here and now and into the future? There's definitely meaningful work to do. Um, I think the first job is always to educate yourself, mm -hmm. to make sure you are not misled. That's that's at least how I approach all of these issues. Um, you know, many people, you know, we want to act, mm -hmm. which is totally understandable, but it's always important to make sure that what you're acting about is real mm. and you always have to understand that you are very easy to fool we we all have we all have biases um you know we're, we're just born with them as human beings and it takes an, an enormous amount of work to correct for them and you never fully do mm. and so the project of educating oneself I view as the primary project. Right. Before you act about something, you educate yourself. And what that means is you seek out the sources that you are tempted to disagree with and engage them as charitably as you can possibly do. Um, we have to make that a kind of a practice and a value. And we have to avoid thinking about politics as if it is, you know, a spiritual pursuit that can't be uh, pierced by, you know, contrary evidence. Um, the more we do that, the better we will, the more successfully we will navigate these issues. Right, indeed. And I think that you've uh, you've just described our work here at Braver Angels. And for folks who want to know more and get involved, you can find us at braverangels.org. Um, and uh, like you said, uh, Coleman, like I've said, there is meaningful work here to be done. And so, um, yeah, Brother Coleman, I salute you uh, and very proud of uh, just, you know, the, the intellectual leadership that you've provided across a variety of fronts, frankly. Uh, but on this issue in particular, and we look forward to welcoming you back on the podcast soon. Absolutely. I'll be back whenever, John. All right, man. Thanks a lot. To everybody else out there, we are building a house united. Take care.